Hey everyone, in this video we'll be looking at Chapter 7, which is Sharing Role Behavior with Modules in Practical Object Oriented Design in Ruby by Sandy Metz. Before we get into the actual content of the chapter itself, I want to take a minute to give you an illustration that might help you, or that might help get the concept of object oriented programming to be a little bit more tangible. And this is an illustration that I give to people sometimes when they're like, what is programming? And how do you like make sense of it? And uh, it's, so it's fairly non-technical, um, but I think it's helpful here. Think about a, a coffee shop, for example, and if you or I were trying to make a coffee shop program, if we were, if we were in a coffee shop and we were drinking coffee and we were just looking at what we saw around us, you know, how would we, how would we go about doing that? So there's a couple ways that you could that you can think of a scene like that. There's, you know, there, and if you go the, the object-oriented way, that's one way. And if you go the functional way, that's another way. And other programming paradigms that have different methods. But since we're doing object-oriented, we'll think about the objects that are that are happening. So there's there's people objects, there classes, if you will. There are subclasses, so there's employees, there's customers, and within employees there's even like cashiers, baristas, what have you. There are cups, there are coffee machines, there are tables, chairs, so there's a lot of objects. And if you defined all of those things, you would more or less have the scene, right? Well, not really, because it's not just it's not just a static thing. It's not just a picture. There's a lot of movement. There's a lot of activity. So we talked about the nouns. Now we're talking about the verbs, and that's like, you know, some people are drinking cups of coffee. Some people are pouring cups of coffee. There's sweeping that's getting done. There is the cashier is checking people out, and so on and so on. So to break a scene down, you have objects and you have the actions. And so that goes along with what we're talking about here, which is attributes versus activities. And it's uh, nouns versus verb, attributes versus behaviors. And so it's, it's, worth, it's worthwhile to think of attributes and behavior independently of each other, but they aren't exclusive of each other because when you add in an attribute, you're probably doing it to add behavior. So roles are behaviors that can be shared between two classes. In the coffee shop example, say you wanted the ability for employees and patrons to drink coffee. You could define that drinking coffee behavior in each of their classes, but that would mean writing it in two places, which isn't great for a lot of reasons, as you can imagine. So how do we win that situation? We use modules, which are simply behavior methods that you can take and then include in other objects. Now that'll make it faster for you to build out other classes because you can just include the drink coffee module without having to write the behavior explicitly in every place that you want it. And possibly just as importantly, when you want to make a change later, you'll be able to change it in one place and then it'll apply everywhere that module is included automatically without more intervention from you. When we're thinking about how to find roles, we can look at the verbs or the activities going on and seeing if there are commonalities. So in the bike trip example that Sandy talks about, we see a lot of people doing the preparing action, and that's something to think about. Although, spoiler alert, we aren't going to make that into a module here because there isn't a common way that each person prepares. Instead, we're going to be looking at something called the schedulable model. And this is a behavior that's common to several objects in the ecosystem right now, like bikes and mechanics. For the mechanics to do their preparing behavior on bikes, they have to be scheduled to work that day. And the bike has to be checked in and available to be worked on by the mechanic. So we're not doing preparing, but we are doing a behavior that's important to both of those objects. So thinking about scheduling, take a minute and think about what 
what are the behaviors and attributes that a schedulable model should have. Okay, You need a start date for a reservation and an end date, of course. You need to have the ability to add and remove reservations and a check to see whether something, mechanic, bike, or whatever, whether something is available or unavailable at a given time. So there's another thing too, depending on what type of object is being sent, you can see here in the graph, a different number of lead days is being returned. This isn't a great situation because it requires unnecessary checks, right? If the target is a bike, lead days is one. If it's a mechanic, lead days is four, and so on all the way down. That's, uh, that's going to be a liability in the future. So how do we get rid of that check while still returning the right number of lead days? The answer is that the instigating class itself, i.e. the bicycle, mechanic, vehicle, and so on, should know its own lead days requirement and send that along with the rest of its query when it's asking to do something with the schedulable module. Now take a look at this graph on page 148, figure 7.3, and just sort of walk with me through the messages that are getting passed. So something out there is asking, is this bike scheduled given a starting and an ending date? Instead of going to the schedule and saying, okay, this class is a bicycle, therefore lead days is X. The lead days itself, that actually lives in the bicycle class itself. And when it calls the scheduling module, it passes its own lead days. So it passes itself, the starting date, which is from here, the ending date, which is from here, and lead days, which is there. And it comes back, the, the schedulable module returns an answer, and the bicycle returns that back to the instigating object. Now, this is the probably the, the crux of the chapter. We have the scheduling functionality. We need it to be available to a lot of classes. And the answer is to put them into a module. And so that's what goes on here. We take this, this idea that we had back here and put it actually into you know some concrete code here. Now, it's important to point out that there is in fact a lead days method here. Even though this is the schedulable module and we're gonna be passing that manually in the bicycle or in the mechanic class, uh, you can see that over here, in fact. Uh, but it's important to have a default so that if some future class calls the schedulable module and doesn't have its own lead days method, the schedulable module won't break. It will just default to itself. It's uh, really important to have that there just for future proofs sake. So where do these module methods fit in the method lookup chain of calls? The answer is that module methods are above most of the parent classes except capital O object itself, which means that if lead days is defined in the including class, the method will take it there, i.e. here in the bicycle class or in the mechanic class. If it's the parent class of say whatever the parent class of bicycle is or the parent class of mechanic, then it'll take it from there. And if it isn't in one of those one of those subclasses or parent classes, then it'll finally go to the module itself. And if it's not in the mod module, then it will try to find it in the super object, which is object itself. And obviously it's not there. And then it'll break. But it won't face that situation because we've taken care of it at the child class level and had it in the module as a safety. So good job. Now things can can get dicey if you're not careful because you can have modules including each other and classes inheriting from each other, which in turn could be sharing behavior and potentially conflicting with each other. And luckily there's more of the chapter for your consideration to help you deal with that issue before it arises. And Sandy offers a few tips kind of in, in rapid fire here. If you're, if you're writing a class that 
receives messages and triages behavior depending on the class of the sender. There's a duck type for you to abstract out and you need to do it because if you don't then you'll have to update that class to compensate for new classes as you add them, right? And that goes back to this one here, right? If scheduled item is bike, if scheduled item is mechanic, if scheduled item is trip, and so on. That's hard to maintain, so just don't do it to yourself. Another one is all of the code in a super class should be able to be legitimate to the classes that inherit from it. So in other words, if some methods are in the bicycle class that aren't common to all bicycles, then it shouldn't be in the bicycle class at all. A concrete example of that is disc brakes. Disc brakes are in a lot of kinds of bikes, but they're not in all kinds of bikes, and so they shouldn't be there. Furthermore, it's also important that subclasses be substitutable for their superclass. In other words, it's a simple logical statement to say that a road bike has to be a kind of bike. That's, that's just intuitive. But in application, that means that the road bike class has to be able to legitimately respond to every message that the bicycle class can. And that makes, that makes sense when your classes are tangible things like bicycles and kinds of bicycles. But it's that, that's a, a concept that you have to keep explicitly in mind when your classes and what they are are more abstract. So for example, I work with a class called Persona. And this is a real life example. What does that mean? And what does that mean for classes that it inherits from, for classes that inherit from it? You know, it's, you have to be careful because a quote unquote Persona that's not as tangible as a bike and a dirt bike. You know what I mean? Lastly, it's important to note that you should aspire to make shallow hierarchies, which means as few layers from superclasses to subclasses as possible. That's something to think about for future proofness, um, because the fewer layers that there are, the easier it is to maintain going forward, and future developers who are getting on board with your project will have a quicker learning curve. So we learned that shared behavior is most easily done in modules. You can write a module and include it in your Ruby classes or even other modules. And this helps your code be dry and maintainable in the future. That's it for chapter seven, folks. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you all in the next one.